Hello, welcome. The legacy of his family name made it clear to him that he would always be linked with the sea. Through his advocacy for the environment, he has reached out to the youth of the planet to protect the oceans. This week on One on One, meet the environmental advocate and documentary maker, Philippe Cousteau. It was almost inevitable that the underwater world of his grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, would shape his destiny. It's hard to carry that name and not be associated with oceans and marine life. Despite the strong French roots of the family, Philippe Cousteau was born and raised in the USA, starting at an early age to discover the watery environment around him. His grandfather had pioneered ocean exploration and brought it to the world with a message of marine conservation through his widely watched documentaries. Philippe followed in his roots, working with television channels to help get the green message out. He focused on young people through the non-profit organization Earth Echo, which he founded at the start of the new millennium with his sister Alexandra, in honor of their late explorer and filmmaker father, also named Philippe, who himself had carried on the well-established tradition of being a true Cousteau. Philippe, I'm glad to have some time with you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Now, it takes more than a birth certificate to be a Cousteau. That's what you said in an interview in a magazine a while back. What, what exactly is it about the, the Cousteau legacy? What is it that, that you mean by that? Well, I mean that uh, it's really about the, the values that uh, one lives one, one's life by. And, and, you know, so much of my work is, is committed to education and, and, and young people. And so that's, that's very much what I tell them oftentimes. It's not because of, you know, my birth certificate that I'm a Cousteau, but but by the values that I try and live my life and, and as being a responsible steward to pass a, you know, this planet and th that my goal is to pass this world on to future generations just a little bit better than the way I found it. Now I'm wondering, with, you know, being a Cousteau, is it possible to not do what you're doing? That is, not go around the world telling people about the impact we're having on it. Is it in the blood? Well, you know, it, I, I have to credit my mother, actually, more than... Um, more than anyone else, I think, in the world. My grandfather had a huge influence on me. He died uh, when I was 17. Uh, my father died six months before I was born. I never knew him. I grew up with his films and his books, etc. cetera. Uh, but it was really my mother who kept that spirit alive for myself and my sister. I think, yes, it, it's certainly possible. She always said, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you're a good person. And you, you know, in, in, a, in your way, you make the world a better place. But, um, I, you know, Growing up with the opportunity to, to meet amazing people and, and to travel and to, um, and to understand the issues that are facing this planet was, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. But you have a message. That's the thing. And, and I wonder how much more people are listening now than they were perhaps, you know, 30, 40 years ago when your grandfather was at his prime. Well, I think that uh, that's, that is the good news. There is no question that there are very serious problems that we face today. Uh, we see them on the headlines, the news around the world, from you know floods and deforestation and, and climate change and ocean acidification and biodiversity loss and the list goes on and on. But I do think that society is making progress compared to when my father, or grandfather, were doing these things you know a few decades ago, especially when I spend time with young people and see the fire that's in their eyes and the passion that they have to to chart a different course. They understand more, I think, than any past generation that we live in a global world, that what we do in one place impacts others elsewhere, and that we have a responsibility and that the environment is not a luxury, uh, but clean air and fresh water are absolutely fundamental to life as we know it. You were born in, uh, in Santa Monica in California in 1980 and pretty much on the ocean there, I guess. Um, at what age did you really become aware that your family, you and your family, were so connected with the sea? Well, you know, again, I didn't know my father uh, because he died a few months before I was born. My mother raised us from the beginning, though, with this understanding of who we were and where we came from. And she, I mean, is, is one of the most amazing people on the, on the planet. Um, Do you remember your first boat trip? You know, I, I was so young, I, knew, I learned to swim before I could walk. So it was, uh, you know, she's from California, she's American. Uh, my father was French, so it made sense. After my father died, she went home. But uh, yeah, I did. I mean, the ocean and, and, and the sea has always been in my blood, which, you know, as we know, uh, um, um, water, you know, all of us are made up of predominantly of water. So all of us essentially are, are water creatures as humans. 
And of course, as you were saying, your father died. It was, it was in a plane crash, in a seaplane crash, just uh, six months before you were born. Um, and I wonder, you, I know your favorite uh, possession, one of his most cherished possessions is his uh, Doxa metal uh, diving watch. Um, and I wonder what sort of, how those memories were instilled into you, how your mother Jan was able to, to tell you about that legacy, how, how you were brought up with that. Well, my mother is a great storyteller. And, uh, you know, probably one of the big influences on my life to do what I do. And, and I was fortunate, in a way, in that I had film, books, et cetera, that my father had made. So, you know, a, a lot of people grow up without a parent, or in some cases, both parents, um, and maybe have a few photographs. But I had film and video and stories and... Uh, um, so in that sense, I was fortunate and was, she, 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 we watched those growing up. She talked, because she spent 13 years on expedition. So she talked about those stories and those experiences and, and she brought it alive for both my sister and I. Your father, your grandfather, of course, is, uh, is quite legendary, having pioneered so much. He, he helped develop the aqualung. He was the first to really pioneer marine conservation and so on. And again, I, you know, you were, you, at least you, were, you got to see him. It's sad. Your father, of course, passed away before you were born. But presumably, he, he took quite a large role in your life in terms of helping you shape your, your ideas, yeah? You know, he did. I, I, got to, I was fortunate enough to see my grandfather you know, several times a year. But being how busy he was, um, we didn't spend huge, long, extended periods of time together. So it was, uh, uh, but, but those moments that we did spend were very impactful. He was, uh, he had an interesting background too, being he was a French Navy commando, wasn't he? And he originally had a, uh, a desire to be in naval aviation, but I think it was, a, it was an accident that uh, forced him to sort of focus on the sea. It is a little known story actually that uh, my grandfather always loved film. He always loved, uh, he would splice together 35 millimeter film back during the days of the, the, the resistance in southern France and during World War II. And since he was a little boy, he loved to make home, home videos. Didn't really know about the ocean, care about the ocean, care about the environment. And it, he broke his back in a car accident and rehabilitated himself. He wanted to fly, but they washed him out of the Air Force and he went into the Navy. He wanted to fly, um, couldn't do that, so he started to rehabilitate himself in the ocean by swimming. And a, his captain, a man named Philippe Taillez, who my father was named after, thus I am named after, gave him a, a, a pair of rudimentary goggles. This would have been back in the you know, 40s. Um, he opened his eyes to this whole new world and became frustrated that all they could do was hold their breath and dive. And my grandmother at the time, her father was on the board of a, of a large global company which still exists, Airly Keed. And it, it just happened that an engineer who worked for that company had invented an industrial valve that could take air from under pressure to ambient air pressure on demand, or regulate that air pressure. And he met this engineer, and together they miniaturized it into what is the regulator known today and co-invented the Aqualung, which then opened up uh, ocean exploration for the last 60 years. He was obviously very, uh, very much into his work, and as you say, you, you only got to see him a few times a year because of his travels. He also had a kind of a strange double life too, didn't he? Because he had kids uh, with his wife and then kids uh, outside the marriage as well. Did that complicate the family environment at all? You know, my sister, my mother, and I did not know about that. Uh, my, unfortunately, my grandfather was not known for being the most uh, faithful husband, but the fact that he had a mistress with two children did not really come to light for us, at least. Um, I think there were some other people that knew about it until my grandmother died in 1990. It did complicate issues when my grandfather died. Um, she took over the Cousteau Society and, um, um, you know, it is doing what it's doing and, and we're doing what we're doing. Now, you're, you're about 17 when, when uh, your grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, passed away, uh, by which time you were pretty much an action man yourself. I mean, apart from the diving, there was trekking and rock climbing and, and even going off to war-torn Sarajevo to give humanitarian aid. Yeah, that was a, that was a crazy adventure uh, with a friend of mine, a crazy idea we had to, to uh, just not long after the war. Uh, we had contact with, the, with an NGO that was based in Sarajevo, and, and we decided to take a train or a bus, actually, at the time um, from where this, my friend lived in Switzerland all the way down to Sarajevo and, and just volunteer down there for a week or so um, until we were basically ran out of money because there were no credit cards, no ATMs, no nothing. We only had the cash on us, and we barely got out um, with, with the cash in hand. Uh, back into Croatia, um, but it was it was important. Those experiences were, were very important and continue to be because 
You know, my, my grandfather was so much about exploring the world around us and making the leaps to understand the importance of protecting the environment. My father's role, the you know, 15 years and the, the 26 films that he did for the Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, as well as his own series, Oasis in Space, as he was becoming a, a, a global leader in conservation, he was really connecting humans to environmental issues. And so I, I always um, felt it was important to understand the human condition as much as the environment because though we like to separate things, we like to separate air and oceans and forests, everything is in one part of one system and humans are part of that system. And so uh, I always felt it was really important to explore. I studied history at university, really understand the human condition as much as possible to inform uh, the work that I wanted to do. Of course, you had that, that legacy of knowing your father's films and your grandfather's films and the work they did. When did you have an idea that you would do it like professionally, that you would actually go into that world? Well, when I was a little young man, I wanted to, uh, I always wanted to be a fireman. Uh, I think it was when I was in my teens, and it was actually when I went to Papua New Guinea for, the, for uh, one of my first proper expeditions and as an adult with scientists and not with family, things like that. Um, 16 went to the highlands of, of New Guinea, which is some of the most remote parts of the planet. And I remember I was walking down the street one day, and my grandfather had always told me what a global world we live in and how everything's connected and how, you know, it, it is such an amazing world, such an amazing planet. And I said, you know, yeah, 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 and seeing is believing, as they say. And I remember walking down this dusty road after two weeks down in the southeastern part of the country doing research on a research vessel and a new species of fish. And then we went up to the highlands and I was anthropologically seeing the people and the culture there, these very, very remote um, um, cultures that have little, if any, uh, connection uh, and influence or exposure to the outside world, the Western world. And I remember walking down the street and, and the thing about where we were in, in the highlands is that when the airplane went to land on the dusty landing strip, they had to circle twice to make sure there were no battles going on. So they lived with spears and bows and arrows and in grass huts and grass skirts. But I remember walking down the street and some of the tribes were wearing Lakers t-shirts, uh, the basketball team in Los Angeles, California, here in the most remote part of the world. And I think it was at that moment that I realized that there are amazing adventures and amazing stories and that we all live in a connected place and, and that my grandfather was so right and that, that I wanted to tell those stories. To what extent did you have to balance life between America where you, where you were born and where you sort of spent most of your time and, and France where, you, where your strong family legacy comes from? Well, most of my life, as you can hear from, people are always disappointed when they meet me that I don't have a, an accent like my grandfather's. Uh, most of my life has been spent here in the U.S., although I did uh, study for university in, in Scotland, um, which was uh, fabulous. I want to touch on some of the, uh, the projects you undertook. As, uh, as time went on in just a moment, we're going to take a short break here. More with Philippe Cousteau when 101 returns. Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with environmental advocate and filmmaker Philippe Cousteau. You actually became the chief ocean correspondent for Animal Planet and for Planet Green, where you created a series of ocean documentaries, actually including Ocean's Deadliest. Now, sadly, your co-host on that, the Australian wildlife, you know, uh, sort of TV star Steve Irwin, uh, Steve Irwin was killed uh, during that. You were actually on the boat when there was that freak accident with the stingray that, that struck him in the chest. Tell me what happened. We were uh, filming in Australia, in northeastern Australia, off just north of Cairns, and a freak accident on a, on a, just a, not, we weren't even filming, it was just a, a dive while we were waiting for the sharks to show up. Um, a stingray barb struck him in the chest and uh, found its, its way, you know, that, that, that just the perfect angle and the perfect depth and the perfect pressure to find its way right between those two ribs at that, the millimeter one way or the other would have missed his heart and it was, uh, and, and broke off and, and basically was like a stiletto in his heart and he made it to the surface. We got him to the back of the boat and then we did uh, CPR and, and, and um, tried to you know, resuscitate him for about an hour and a half until we got to the nearest island where the paramedics had come out on a, on a helicopter. And when they got to him, obviously we, we didn't know what the extent of the damage was, we just know he had a gash in his chest. Um, when they got to him they did some diagnostics and found that there was a puncture in his heart uh, and there was nothing. I mean, it, if it had happened in a hospital, he would have been lucky to survive. So off of, you know, a few hours off, off the shore of, uh, off the coast of, of Australia, there was nothing any of us could have done. And it was, a, it was a terrible loss, I think, not only to everybody who knew him and worked with him, especially to his family, um, but to the world as a whole. 
Yeah, he himself was very much an advocate and actually helped uh, so many young people to, to realize what the world's about too. Of course, you know, the ocean is a very, uh, it's, it's a majestic and beautiful place, very powerful place, but of course, very dangerous place. And, and I wonder on the expeditions you've done now, what danger you've had to face? Well, you know, I, um, I mean, we actually during that series, we worked with box jellyfish, which is the deadliest creature land or sea on the planet. We worked with the great white sharks and, and what many people would consider are very dangerous animals. But I have to say that I've never felt threatened by animals. Um, but there's been a couple times when I thought um, it was over with, with people coming after us. And, and so, uh, you know, people are always afraid of sharks and always afraid of crocodiles and always afraid of snakes. But we get into a car every day, we drive down the street, and it is infinitely more dangerous to do that. I mean, if you think you're going to get attacked by a shark, you should go out and buy a lottery ticket, right? Because the chances are more that you will win the lottery than get attacked by a shark. Um, and yet people have these irrational fears. I've never been threatened by animals, but a few times when, one in particular in Papua New Guinea, actually when I was, when I was 16, when I thought that, um, that, that it, it might be over. Now, of course, uh, through your father's work and, and, his, the mem and his memory, you, I'm sure that you know, he was one of your mentors, one of your ins inspirations, but who else has inspired you over the years? Um, you know, I, I uh, indeed, my grandfather, my mother, as I said earlier, was a huge inspiration for me. Um, but I had a, a few really good teachers growing up. You know, I, I, it was, I was 13 or 14 when you start to be a young man and, and puberty kicks in and, and not having a real strong male role model in my life was, was, was a tough time and I was having a hard time in school. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, in eighth grade, I believe it was, I was about 14, 15 years old, where I had one or two really, really outstanding teachers um, who became kind of role models for me and who took me under their wing and introduced me to things like rock climbing and exploration and, um, and getting outdoors, because I was never really big into team sports. Um, and that's tough, especially in the United States where it's all about football and soccer and baseball, et cetera. Um, and they, you know, they showed me that was okay. And, um, and they became really strong. So I had some really, I was lucky to have some really great teachers as well. In 2000, uh, in the year 2000, Alexandra, your sister, and you set up uh, uh, Earth Echo International, uh, where you, you really wanted to focus on young people. How, what have you managed to, to achieve uh, since you set that up? Well, it's, uh, um, it's been an amazing experience, and, and we're doing some very exciting things. We're really focused, as you said, on, on youth and education and the environment, mostly here in the United States, but a lot of our programs are digitally based. You know, my grandfather loved technology. He loved, I know he would have been amazed by the cell phones and the internet that are available today. Um, and some of the most powerful stories in journalism that have emerged over the last year or two have been citizen journalism. And so we're launching a commitment um, to empower youth to be citizen journalists, to train youth across the country and across the world to be citizen journalists and to be a voice in their communities, utilizing cell phones and flip cams and, and uh, the, the tools that are available to, to us today, and to empower them to have a voice and to empower them to take action. And um, we uh, were very excited about that particular program because, again, with the internet and with the technology that exists today, anybody can be uh, a spokesperson for these issues. Do you worry at all that young people don't have the sense of what the world is about because they're so absorbed in technology, computers, and so on, that they're not out there? You know, growing up as a kid, I was out playing all the time. I was out there in nature. Uh, and I have to think about now how much opportunity I get to get, you know, feel grass under my, on my feet, you know, it's kind of. It's a, it's a, it's a very controversial issue. It's a, there's, a, there's a debate raging, uh, certainly in the conservation movement, about that very issue, uh, what, what some in this country would call nature deficit disorder. I think there's, a, there's an ironic twist, though, to that, in that the social world and the social networking, the technology that we live in, I think have actually caused young people to understand that we do live in a global community, perhaps more than, certainly more than my generation, where the town that you were in was the town that you were in, and the people that you knew, I mean, in general, that was your sphere and your world. Now, through Facebook and other tools, people can be connecting to the challenges, you know, in places like, you know, from a crisis place from, from, from Sudan or, or the Middle East or, or Iran with the, 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 the revolution of a year and a half ago to, you know, challenges in, in the United States or in Europe, etc. So I think there's a, a greater sense of, of globalization on the part of young people. I have, I spent a lot of time traveling around the world, mostly in the United States, but in Canada and other places too. And I've probably given, I've given presentations, we counted it up the other day in the last uh, year to over 100,000 young people. 
um, you know, from from six to, to eight to twenty in the twenty in their twenties. And I do conferences for adults as well. And I do see a huge change in young people. And I think there's great hope. And so I, I'm not discouraged. That is what gives me hope. They are more connected, more switched on, more eager to do something than even when I graduated from high school 12 years ago. Is it all action adventure, or is there is there a price to pay for do, doing what you do? You know, there's the, the, there's a price that we pay for everything. Um, and it, it sounds glamorous and exciting and fun, but you know I run a nonprofit and we have the daily responsibilities of raising money and keeping people employed, uh, especially in an economy, a global economy like we're faced with right now. It's very, very difficult. Um, you know, I'm proud to say we've managed not to, to lay anybody off over the last year and a half, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's constantly a struggle in the face of overwhelming interests and there's trillions of dollars that's floating around that, that is still trying to destroy the environment and exploit the environment and exploit people versus those of us on a shoestring budget that are trying to fight against that. So it, it, it's, it's a constant struggle, but it's, it's, uh, it's worth doing. Have you set yourself any long-term goals? To solve the problems that we face in the world, to solve um, the conflict and the crises and the suffering and the pain um, takes a chorus of people. Um, it's not any one individual that can achieve that goal. And I hope that when I look back on my life, that I can, I will have been one of those, one of that chorus, hopefully a loud member of that chorus, and that I will be proud of the legacy that I inherited and that I did justice to the memory of my father and my grandfather. Um, and, and that's my long, long-term goal. Uh, that, that I hope and, and that, that people as a whole will, will say, you know, he did, he made the world a better place. I was going to ask you what you wanted your legacy to be. It's pretty much uh, answered it there. But presumably, again, it still comes down to now you've got the Cousteau blood. You have to keep doing what you do. Well, and I love what I do, you know, and, and uh, through Earth Echo and the work my work with the Discovery Networks and, uh, um, with, you know, all the news networks that I work with. And um, I do love what I do, and, and it's a, it's a, I feel privileged every single day. Philippe Cousteau, I wish you luck. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Pleasure.